journalism as we know it, unfortunately, is in crisis these days as the internet has changed the way information is gathered and spread, and the advertising revenue that once helped to keep newspapers fairly flush has jumped to the cyber platform. So newspapers do not have that income source anymore. Because of that, newspapers are being bought out, newsrooms are being turned upside down, and newspapers are being closed down or slashed to a couple of publication days a week. And we can see that not just nationally, but locally. Our local courier, which had been owned by a one family, the Heminger family, for many, many years and for four generations just sold to another family of newspapers and there was a newspaper in today's courier talking about um, some of the, the the struggles in journalism how many newspapers have closed journalists themselves are under fire these days some being accused of fake news by those who just don't like the content hint that's not fake news journalism particularly local journalism is critical for a democracy to work even when democracy is very messy. Good journalism provides that watchdog function that it was designed to do as what we call the fourth estate, keeping an eye on those in power to make sure that those who have been elected to serve the people are indeed serving the people and not themselves. We need good journalism to keep our public informed and keep the powers that be accountable. So our society needs talented, ethical, dedicated journalists. Today, you will get to hear from one of my favorite talented, ethical, and dedicated journalists, and she just happens to be a journalist in Ohio. We're delighted to have Holly Zachariah here from the Columbus Dispatch as our Wilkin Chair guest speaker to offer her insight into the life in the fast lane and furious lane of today's professional media. Holly is the senior Metro Desk reporter and internship coordinator at the Columbus Dispatch, and after many years of covering crime and corruption, angst and jubilation, heart-wrenching pathos and heartwarming commitment, she is here to share some of her insight today. Technology has allowed us to collect information more easily. You may hear a little bit about that today. But the best journalism is not done by technology, not done by um, emailing and texting. You can't do good journalism without hitting the street, going to where the news is happening, speaking face to face to people, and not only listening to them, but watching their behavior. Holly talked to our news writing class a little bit about that earlier today. Holly recently co-wrote a series about one of the most troubled areas of Columbus, a three-mile stretch of Sullivan Avenue. And in fact, the series, she brought along copies of the series that you can, can pick up later. The series called Suffering on Sullivan explored how Sullivan got that way and what can be done to change it. And it sparked a great deal of impassioned response from readers. That's good journalism. While she was trained as a traditional print journalist, Holly has an excellent command of social media as a tool to promote solid journalism. Holly consistently posts media, or she consistently posts stories that show the visceral humanity of what's at the foundation of really well-written news. She promotes not only her own stories and those of her dispatch colleagues, but stories around the globe that reveal the juxtaposition of frailty and resistance in humanity that we all have to navigate in this stressful period in, in our history. Holly has a positive branding on her social media feed. Those of you who are looking at personal branding, this is, this is very important. Every day she posts multiple stories on good news stories that are going on locally, domestically, globally. Anyone who ever complains there's nothing positive in the news clearly does not follow Holly Zachariah on social media. Please welcome our Wilkin Chair guest speaker of the evening, Holly Zachariah. Do I have to use the microphone for the recording? Because I have a real, God gave me no inside voice. <laughs> Everybody can hear me. Do I have to use the mic? Because okay. I really like to move around a little bit. First of all, uh, can you just follow me around? and say nice things about me wherever I go. <laughs> that, made I feel, that made me feel really good. Two, um, I appreciate you having me here today. This is my second year at Finley, and they invited me back, so that's always a good thing. 
Three, I want to say I never get nervous in front of a crowd because take it or leave it. You're going to learn something, I hope, and if you don't, you can leave and think, well, that's an hour I'll never get back. But I'm super nervous now because my high school journalism teacher and the reason I'm a journalist is sitting in the front row. <laughs> and uh, Kathy Brooks has, it remains my single um, greatest supporter and um, took me under her wing as a, as a high schooler who didn't know anything about anything. And um, I'm an award-winning journalist because of her. So carry on. <laughs> frustrated by the news. <laughs> the reason he's there is because I don't talk about politics the whole time I'm talking about media literacy. I'm just talking about a few things. One, so that you can get a little bit better understanding of how we do what we do. Because part of the reason we've gotten to this point in our nation where you don't believe us and you don't believe journalists, is because for decades, we worked behind this cloak of secrecy. Just my name on the front page of the paper was supposed to be good enough. You didn't know anything about me, but Holly Zachariah wrote it, so it must be true. And those days are over. So I think the more we talk, as journalists, the more people we can all get in front of to let you know how we do what we do and let you ask questions of what we do, the better off we'll be. Also talk a little bit about being a smart consumer of the news. How do you get your news? Is it the best way to get the news? And how do you know that what you're reading is true and accurate? And then in terms of my social media and my Twitter, let me just say, if anything ever gets me fired, it's going to be my Twitter account. <laughs> um, so anyway, my cat is here because inevitably, when I'm talking about media literacy and consuming the news, we get to politics. And so every time everybody gets a little worked up, I'm going to show you a picture of Jinx. Because then we're all just going to not talk about politics anymore. Does that make sense? It does. So <clears throat> I'm so much of what was said in introduction to the speak off is exactly what I'm gonna talk about today. You know, the topic of the speech is mountains and molehills. And the reality of it is, everything is a mountain now. There are no molehills. Because everything, the minute I hit click on my tweet, or the minute our website posts a story, it's the shot heard around the world and there's no going back. And so everything becomes a mountain. It used to be. And if anybody says, okay, boomer to me, I'm gonna make you leave. So, but I'm gonna talk about the old days a little bit. So it used to be, as a print journalist, I had 24 hours to get it right. So whenever we, our newspaper hit your doorstep in the afternoon, back when I started, and then the morning. So whatever happened on Monday, I had until noon on Tuesday to get it right. And I don't have that luxury anymore. And I'm, if you hear nothing else I say today, hear this. I'm 30 years in this business, which I won't talk about how old that makes Kathy Brooks. <laughs> 30 years in this business, and I have never met a journalist anywhere who got up in the morning and said, I'm gonna screw this up today. <laughs> Never. We make mistakes. And so, for example, I'm a crime reporter. Back when I had 24 hours to get it right, I'm standing at a crime scene, and a guy in uniform, who's a police officer, says to me, Holly, you know what happened here, right? And he tells me, I had 24 hours to check and double check and look for other sources of information. And now, 
I ask a second source who's standing behind him, I'm like, is that true? And if it's yes, then I feel comfortable. I have no reason to believe that man in uniform is lying to me. So I send it back to the office and it becomes part of the story. He wasn't lying to me. At that moment, what he told me, he believed to be true. Half an hour later, they get new information. The story changes. We update our website. But you know what the people who tweet at me and email me and text me say? They don't say, thanks, Holly, for standing there in the rain for another five hours trying to get the truth. Why'd you lie to me in the first place? I didn't lie. What I had five hours ago was what we believed to be true. But in the age of information, it goes like this. Does any of that make sense? So I steal pretty much, I have no original thoughts. I steal them all. So Katie Couric a couple years ago did a, um, did a documentary about the news. She talked a lot about affirmation, not information. This is not rocket science. We go, the way we consume our news and our information today, we're not looking for other ideas. We're looking for people who believe what we believe. The algorithms of Facebook and Twitter are set based on everything the world knows about you, and it's everything, don't think they don't, to feed you the headlines and the information that you've already been interested in. I don't expect you to read a paper newspaper anymore. I hope you do, and I would encourage you to, <clears throat> but the reality is you're not. So if you're looking at my newspaper, the Columbus Dispatch, on your phone, unless you're clicking on what we call the digital edition, the e-edition, which still looks like a newspaper, it's just, it's, it's, you turn the page like you would a digital magazine. Unless you're looking at that, if you're just looking at my app and my website, you're still only seeing headlines, and you're picking and choosing what you need to see, what you're going to click on. As opposed to, when everyone read a newspaper, you saw things you weren't after. I call it going hunting. So I get made fun of at the dispatch because I still use a real dictionary at my desk. And I use it all the time. And they laugh at me. I said, why can't you just highlight your word like everybody else in America and hit dictionary or thesaurus on your computer? Do you know why? Because if I hit, if I highlight the word and I hit send, it's only going to give me that one word. But if I have to look it up in a dictionary, I have to find it on the page. And you know what? I might find a new word. I might learn something I didn't already know. And so that's how we can, should consume our news. Instead of just going looking for the one thing, we should, we should pay attention to what's around it. For example, for the students in the room, I'm sorry that you have to stay through all of this for extra credit. It will be the most painful extra credit you've ever had to <laughs> But my son grew up in a house, my son's 24. He grew up in a house where I, we read the news together every day. Does, we watched the evening news, we watched the Today Show in the morning, and at six o'clock every night we watched the, you know, NBC. Does he read a newspaper today? Does he watch a newscast today? Absolutely not. He could not have grown up in a more news conscious house. But he'll hear something on the radio, or he'll overhear a conversation. He's in the Navy, active duty Navy. So he appreciates, he wants to know what's going on in the government. What does he do? He Googles whatever he heard a snippet of on the radio and does YouTube video. One video comes up and he reads it and he thinks he's got all the information. Does that make sense? Once I get going, I don't stop. So if you have questions, just ask me. Are y'all awake? <laughs> So let's talk about our biases. 
For those of you that were here during those three speeches, you heard that word a lot. Part of the degradation of the way the general population views journalism is, our, again, our own fault. Because back when I was a young journalist, when pterodactyls flew around campus, <laughs> they would say, you know, you're not allowed to talk about, no, again, it's this cloak of secrecy, right? You don't talk about your opinions, you don't vote in partisan elections, you don't speak out at public events, even if you're there as a resident and not a journalist. You know, no one can know that you have a, a beating heart and that you're human. Well, that's just dumb. And if any journalist stands in front of you, and again, I'm speaking as Holly Zachariah, a nobody journalist in central Ohio. I am not speaking on behalf of my company, should they ever see this video. Just want to make that clear. <clears throat> but in my humble opinion, if a journalist stands in front of you and says to you that they are 100% objective and that they have no opinion on that, that's not true. It's just not true. What we have to do is recognize our biases. We have to recognize how we feel, make sure that what we're covering, we're covering accurately and not seeing it. Who, whose speech had the glasses, the colored sunglasses? It's a great analogy, fantastic. Make sure I'm not seeing it through my eyes, but I'm seeing it through this. I have a whole class I teach called the Empathetic Reporter. And I won't get into it because that's not what you're here for, but I'll just say this. As a crime reporter, if I'm in your life, you're having the worst day you've ever had. So it's really important to me to care about people as humans. That's what I do. I, care, I genuinely care about you. But the challenge of being an empathetic reporter is I need to make sure I'm not feeling their pain for them. And that I'm not, when I'm writing what they said or what they felt, that I'm not, I'm not transferring my own perceptions of pain. So what does any of this mean? <clears throat> a couple of years ago in Columbus, we had um, a horrible accident at the Ohio State Fair where a ride blew apart and several people were injured and one man, one team, was killed instantly. I run our internship program at the Dispatch. So I work to mentor our interns. This was summer. Our interns, I'm so proud of them, they did the bulk of this coverage for us. <clears throat> Long story short, the next morning, this happened late at night, Next morning, it's all hands on deck in our newsroom. How are we gonna divvy this up? What are we gonna do? I may mention that I'm sort of our tragedy reporter. That has come over the years because it's just, we're all good at something, right? Every one of us has a talent. And I've become good at being comforting to someone who's hurting and still let them tell their story. So I'm the one, when something bad happens, we'll, we'll send help. So this story broke, and we found out who the boy was. And our job, and we can debate it, I'm happy to if you want to or not, but our job is to make him not just a name in the paper. And I can only do that by going and knocking on the doors of the people who loved him and saying, I'm sorry for what's happened. But I'm here, and I want to listen, and I want to tell people who Tyler Gerald really was. So we ran a background check and found that he came from a split family. Mom on one part of town, dad on the other. Again, to cut to the chase here, um, I thought I was doing the right thing. And I told one of our interns, I said, I want you to go to the dad's house. Because I thought it would be the easier, the easier interview. I'll go to the mom. 
Now this is a good time for me to tell you that I'm a single mom of a son whose dad wasn't ever in the picture until my boy was old enough to say, look at my boy. So I took what I thought would be the difficulty. I sent my intern to the dad's house. Turns out, I was just pulling around the corner to pull up in front of the mom's house. My photographer was driving, and my phone rings. And I answered it. And it's my intern, and he's like, he doesn't know. He doesn't know. The dad doesn't know. What do I do? <clears throat> so we got through that hurdle, and we dealt with it. The mom politely told me, I'm, I'm not ready to talk. So I get back to the office, Michael ends up, we deal with it and it's a long way we dealt with it, but I called the authorities and said you need to get somebody over to the dad's house. We need to first make sure we had the right dad. What if somehow we got it wrong? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that they, the dad hadn't had much to do with him ever. Admitted that to us. I don't really know much about my boy. He lived in a neighborhood that was a troubled neighborhood. The complex where the dad lived, generally it's a, it's a well-known complex in the city of Columbus where most everyone who lives there is dealing with some sort of addiction or mental health issue. He never brought Michael into his apartment, so they had this uncomfortable conversation in the hallway. At one point, the dad says, he always wanted, he was a great storyteller or something like that. The dad said he was always writing books about superheroes. He goes, I've got a book that he wrote when he was like five. And the dad goes in and brings the book out and gives it to Michael. So Michael comes back to the office. By now it's like 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm the lead writer on the story for tomorrow. We're talking about what we've got. And I said, we're not going to use the dad. Now why would I say that? Because my bias, and I own it, was if that were my boy, And something happens to him, and it's his dad that shows up on the front page of the newspaper the next week. <coughs> Heaven help the report. Was I right? Of course not. But that's why there's more than one person in a newsroom. If you hear nothing else, hear this. We don't do the news. We don't do journalism. We don't write the news in a vacuum. We have conversations that are hard and painful every day. Why are we doing this? Are we doing this the right way? What do we do about this? So we had the conversation. I said, I'm not writing that. And all credit to my intern who said, I, I think that's wrong. And he called me on that. So we had a conversation about it. And you know what? We used the dad. His pain was real. His grief was real. He had a right to it. Now, I didn't lead with the dad. But he was certainly in the story. Did I pay a price for that? Probably, because the mom still hasn't talked to me to this day. But the, the point is, journalists have feelings and biases. And we have to keep them out of our writing. That's the challenge. Does that make sense to anybody? Does it help you at all when you think about what you're reading? And remember the conversations that we have in the news. I want you to remember that. Reporters are people too. I have a t-shirt that says that. Reporters are people too. So, biases. Everybody, do you need a picture of my cat yet? Are you bored? <laughs> or do you want to go? Go ahead. So how do you compartmentalize? So I'm currently working for Spectrum News. I'm doing kind of packages and stories with them. I've come across times where I'm reporting on a story and it's something I've experienced. It's sure. either a trauma or it's an emotional topic or something like that. So then how do you compartmentalize so it'll work where I'll push it aside, I'll push it aside, and then come the next day or a couple hours later, I'll kind of crack? So how do you separate kind of yourself kind of looking in rather than like connecting to the topic? I don't think you do. Okay. I think, and we've talked about this a lot, again, because I'm internship coordinator, the, covering the Me Too movement as a woman, 
especially as a woman on campus for my young journalists, has presented very unique challenges. And I don't think, I don't think you do. I think you use that perspective to help make smarter reporting. It's ask smarter questions because it's something you know. Journalists are always going to do a better job writing about things they understand. So if these are things we intrinsically understand, we're going to do a better job. Now, then you look at my answer from a few minutes ago when I said, but make sure that you're not transferring. There's a difference between bringing it as a perspective and an understanding and being an empathetic reporter. And you have a right to get angry as a reporter, but you can't let it cloud what you're doing. You, you have to just understand that. And then you go home and you practice good self-care. <laughs> right? Self-care is important no matter what you do. And that weekend, you, you, you're confident. Your editors have gone through the story. You're, everybody's confident that it's a rock-solid piece of reporting that's going to do good and spread true and real information. And then Saturday night at 6 o'clock, you sit down with your girlfriends and be like, my gosh, can we talk about this? And there's nothing wrong with that, right? So for you, you're not here for extra credit. And you're here because you want to talk about, how do I know what I read is right? I want to repeat something that Diana said at the beginning that I think is absolutely critical. This whole, I don't use the term fake news. I refuse. I refuse. Because it's not news. It's just lies. So what happens is, Again, if you go back, and I, I don't say this because I'm just trying to be like this ancient old woman, but I think you have to understand sort of the evolution of news. And one of the things that I, one of the classes I took 15 years ago was an HR class at work. We had to take it because we were, we were learning how to, how to be better reporters to attract millennials to our newspaper. And it was a fascinating discussion of, of of how the consumption of information has changed over time. And one of the things that has stuck with me through all of that is back when I was a little girl, which in reality, I call myself old, but we're not talking, like there were, there were cars on the roads, we had running water and electricity, so it wasn't all that long ago. There were three channels that you watched, NBC, ABC, and CBS. Everybody watched the same thing. There were three places to go for information. And you could choose which you believed and which you didn't, but there were three. There's an infinite amount of places to go for information today. So what that means as a consumer of the news is it's on you. And it's a lot of work to figure out where your news is coming from. So you have to read the URLs. You're scrolling Facebook and you think, I, I ask, my friends and I have absolute, I just get so angry my head blows off my body. I'm like, you're a best friend to a lifelong reporter. Where do you get your news? Facebook. Stop it. <laughs> Stop getting your news off Facebook. Because you know, so, so, <clears throat> You have to look at, these are obvious examples. I start with the obvious ones because these are clear. Redstate.com and bluestate.com. If you're going to those websites for news, you know what you're going to get over here, and you know what you're going to get over here. But how many times do you read the URL? If you're clicking on Facebook and you think, oh, that looks interesting, go click on it. And you click on it. Do you go up and look at the URL? If you tell me you do, <laughs> maybe some of you do. But we're busy. Who has time for that, right? I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, oh, <laughs> there's the cat. Here's a perfect example. 
I used this last year when I was here because I think it's a really good example. Shot heard around the world is where we started. This was a couple weeks before First Lady Barbara Bush actually died. So this was uh, breaking-cnn.com was the URL that put that story out there. Breaking-cnn.com. So even if you're looking at URLs, well, it's CNN, it must be true. I'll share it on Facebook. I'm going to tweet it out. And it around the world before somebody says, wait a minute, Mrs. Bush isn't dead. So why does this happen? And I would encourage you, and I, because I move around so much and the poor cameraman's going to get sick when he has to watch this, because like, I've lost my notes. But it, see me afterward if you want to know. There was a fantastic article not very long ago, just a couple weeks ago, posted about why do people even do this? Who's the dude that decided, I know what I'll do today. I'll build a website and say Barbara Bush is dead. And I'll just send it out there and see what happens. But it's a business. They sell ads on their website. And people buy ads on their website. And there are, and the article that I can, I can link you back to, they interviewed a guy. Why do you do this? Because they can. People send it out. It's, it's manufactured. It is not fake news. It is not news. It is manufactured information. It's not just you that gets caught. Can somebody play my Syria video? Yes. You've probably all seen it, but just in case, in case you just get your news from Twitter and you haven't, we'll go back. It's that second tab. <laughs> get it though by the way real clear politics I don't recommend it <laughs> but when I googled the video that's the first site that comes up it is a political hack job website but it's the first one that came up can you get it to play uh, well anyway have you all seen the Syria video do you know what I'm talking about yes so it played earlier when we did it at any rate ABC News national ABC News bring in a video Top story of the night, that this is what it looks like after Donald Trump said, we're not gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna bail on Syria. And they played this dynamic video, 46 seconds long, of just thousands and thousands of mortars and rounds blowing across, you know, the countryside. And it was a video from a Marine training in Kentucky at a Kentucky farm a couple years ago where every year they gather and they just shoot as many rounds as they can in like 35 seconds. So it's not just you. Now here's what happened with that video. The news stories on certain websites said that into that vacuum of non-information, people that we're now we're talking about, why did ABC do this? Rushed a familiar barrage of cynical accusations. People tweeting and Facebooking and blogging that it wasn't really an error at all but an intentional use of false footage to advance an ideological agenda. People in America and elsewhere believe that ABC News, believed that ABC News, one of the oldest and most trusted networks in this country, intentionally misled millions of American viewers by using a Marine Corps fun weekend barrage of firefight and getting you to believe that it was that it was Syria. Because they hate Donald Trump. Because they're all left-wing journalists. 
who don't like our politics and they're out to, to um, you know, color everything we do. That's what people, and those are the tweets that went around. And that's what spread on Facebook. It's time to go back to my cat because we're done talking about that. So, but do you see, do you see what happens? Now, how did that happen? We don't know because ABC News would never say. So that's a problem. If they said in the last two weeks, I've not seen it. Now, I looked again yesterday. It's possible they've said somewhere, but I've, it's not gotten very widespread attention. In the immediate aftermath, every story was, ABC News has declined to comment on how the error occurred. Now, we can speculate, and my speculation, for whatever that's worth for, as the owner of a 26 and a half pound house cat, is that it was a Sunday night. There are young interns working in the room, the research office, and someone tells them, find us, a find us some footage of what's going on in Syria. How do they find it? They Google Syria footage. And somewhere out there, at some point, some website had labeled that Syria. Wherever it is. And they used it. Could it have been something more dark? Yes. Do any of us who are responsible and ethical journalists believe that? No. Because if it was, ABC would have said, I would like to think ABC would have owned that. They would have said, we have fired the reporter, who we now know did this on purpose. And they didn't. But the, but the point being, and I, are you all asleep yet? I got like five. And I, I have two quick other things I want to get to, but the point is, we, as journalists, get caught in the same trap. Again, you think back to when there were three networks. When we, and I never worked in TV, but I know enough about TV, and we did the same thing. Well, I'll tell you from a newspaper perspective. We, have a, we, have, we call it the morgue. And it is, it is where all of the actual newspaper clippings from the dawn of time live in files that we cut out. I, my first journalism job when I was 17 in high school was cutting out papers for the morgue at my hometown paper, filling them in there. So if you had a story on Syria, you went down to the morgue and you pulled your Syria file and you used what was in there. Same thing goes if you were a television studio. You went to your storehouse, your warehouse of information, all of your footage that you'd ever had, and you pulled a clip of Syria and you used it. That's not what we do today. We pull information from everywhere, which is why those speeches that these three students gave today are more important than anything I'm saying up here right now. Because you have to understand how to, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. Oh, there's the cat again. I'm not sure why I can't get this. Don't worry about it. It takes a lot of work to backtrack where something came from. Who was the one that pulled the um, study, the FDA study? So I'm a military and veterans affairs reporter. This is the same story in the Washington Post and the Washington, the Washington Examiner. Washington Examiner has a reputation for having conservative leanings. What that means is, it used to mean on their editorial pages. The news we produced was one thing. The opinion pages, the editorials that our editorial staff wrote was never the twain shall meet. Your editorial staff, your, your opinion writers and your news writers. And so newspapers got their leanings largely because they wrote conservative editorials. So this is the same story 
from a conservative and a, what's known as a, li a more liberal paper. So we talk about loaded language, right? So this headline, California and the feds are silent after Trump disrupts National Guard negotiations. Who's that put the blame on? California and the feds. How dare they not say anything at all? Look at those people don't care what's really going on. Trump escalates feud with California governor and refuses to pay for National Guard deployment. Who's that one put the blame on? And President Trump. There's no getting around that those two headlines give you very different opinions. So if I'm just a military reporter and I'm writing another story that's sort of ancillary to that, and I read those two, what do I do? Well, it's a lot, again, it's a lot of work. So I have to go back and I look for a study. I find the source on my own. Or I go directly to the office. This is about the National Guard. You know what? Call the National Guard's public information office. Tell them you're a reporter and you want to find out more information about what's really going on. In terms of news that's not true, again, it's not news, just stuff that's not true, you can Google a specific quote. I tell the interns all the time, again, 99% of the time, when someone says to you, you misquoted me, you got, that's not what I said. That's not true. It is what you said. What the reporter did was take it out of context. That's what happened. Again, not intentionally. I tell people, I do a lot of public information officer training, particularly for cops and law enforcement officers, how to deal with the media. And I tell them, if, you're, if there's a reporter interviewing you, if I'm interviewing you, and I'm taking notes, and I only ever write down what you say, and I don't write down what I'm saying, that's a red flag. Because that's okay if I'm going to go back to the office and write the story that day or next day's paper. But I work ahead a lot. So I'm doing interviews on Monday. I'm doing interviews on Tuesday. I'm doing interviews on Wednesday. Thursday rolls around, I write my story for the Sunday paper. If I didn't write down the question, and I don't have to write down the whole question, but if I didn't give myself some visual cues to remember what we're talking about here, because what happens in an interview is I'll say, you know, let's talk about this. And then you, you go off on something more interesting. Because so I'm writing that, and then three pages into my notes later I say, now let's circle back to that, you know, this thing you said 15 minutes ago. But if I take those notes right there, we're not talking about that thing you said 15 minutes ago. We're talking about that thing you said right now. And so when I go to put the story together, so, so what we do matters, and we have to get it right. Are you all bored to death? So any questions? I got one last thing to leave you with, because they said about 45 minutes. Um, I got other, I could talk forever, or we can talk about the cat, I don't know why you got so fat. Happy to tell you that. Um, one quick thing, can I do one more thing? Sure. Anybody tell me who that, what that guy's name is? There's a door prize in it, if you know. Anybody? Where do you people get your news from? Facebook? <laughs> His name is Carson King. And Carson King was at CBS ESPN Game Day in Iowa. And he got on camera with that son. And they, and People Venmoed him $16,000. So the next day, Carson King says, I'm going to donate. I, I was kidding. It was a joke. I don't need your $16,000. I'm going to donate it to the Children's Hospital. And people sent him $1.14 million. So the local newspaper at the Des Moines Register wrote a story about this. Everybody everywhere wrote a story. But as the local paper, they wanted to do a profile. Who is Carson King? So they did a profile. 
here's where it went off the rails. As part of that, the newspaper reporter backgrounded him. Just did a basic Google search, ran through his social media, those sorts of things. Turns out, six, seven, eight years ago, he had a few racist tweets. So the reporter goes back to the office and says, you know, the dude's got some questionable tweets from a few years ago. What do I do about this? The editor says, well, you need to ask him about them. Now, if you want to debate where I fall on that, I'm happy to talk about that. But, so he asked him about it. And he says, the reporter wrote a really long personal piece about this last week in the Columbia Journalism Review. And the reporter said, his story is that he told him when he was talking about this, look, I know this is, this is like, this is just part of the narrative of, you know, you've matured. Look, at, look what great work you're doing now. I'm not going to make a big deal about this, but I found your tweets. What do you have to say about it? Well, by this time, he's famous. You know, all of, every media outlet in the country is calling. You know, TMZ's got him on. And that's how young people decide whether they're famous or not, whether you're on TMZ. TMZ's got him on, so he has a PR person at this point. So they tell him, we've got to get ahead of this. So a couple hours before the Des Moines Register posts its profile of him, he holds a press conference saying, look, I was young and dumb, and I had some inappropriate tweets a few years ago, and I'm sorry, but look, I've been given $1.14 million to the local children's hospital. The Des Moines Register reporter had to go into hiding because he had so many death threats from all across the country for being such a jerk, for looking for this guy's tweets. And, and by now the perception was he basically threatened him. Look, I'm gonna give your, I'm gonna tell people about your tweets. So the kid held a press conference to get ahead of it. When in reality, the reporter was saying, look, I feel like we should mention this because if I don't find him, somebody else will. And there's the rub for journalists. I got into a heated, you talk about Twitter? I try to put cat pictures on Twitter. I don't debate on Twitter. You don't debate me, I'll meet you for coffee. Or, but I'm not debating you in 280 characters or less. But I did get into a heated debate with one of the, one of the, one of the public officials that I cover regularly on this. And I said, do you know what would have happened if I, as a responsible reporter, had written this glowing profile about this fantastic kid who's so wonderful that he's donating $1.14 million to a charity. And somebody in their basement, because I guarantee you 100%, somebody in their basement unearths those tweets and says, really? Looks to me like the dude doesn't like African Americans. And then all those people that have said they trust me as a reporter are going to come at me and say, some reporter you are. So, you know, especially my African-American friends and followers are going to say, what, did you just want to ignore the fact that he's a racist? So do you see the dilemma it puts us in? So <clears throat> the Des Moines Register fired the reporter. And that's the end of that story. I've kept you too long. I have a million other things I want to say. I won't say them. Here he is at the end of it. I'll leave you with this. No, I'll leave you with this. It's okay. <laughs> I started this by saying I think that even if you think everything I said today is ridiculous, I hope that you leave here understanding that journalists care about what they do. And that I cry when I go home at night. And that I do all those things and I backtrack all those sources. And I still get it wrong. Sometimes I just still get it wrong. And I don't deserve to have my life threatened when I do. And I don't deserve to have my heart or my ethics called into question. And neither does anybody else. It's just like police officers. They're bad cops. They do bad things. And you know what happens? The other police officers run them out of the business. 
they eventually get caught, they get charged, or they get fired, and they move on. It's no different in the world of journalism. We've had bad eggs, look up plagiarism and Pulitzer Prize surprise winning journalists. See if they're still journalists. So I'll leave you with this. This hangs on all my walls, my home office wall, my office at work. Every intern that I have gets a copy of it. And it comes from the intro to the DC Guide to Writing Comics. DC Comics, you know? They have a guide on how to write comics. And this, is the, this is the introduction. Here's what I'd like you to do for me. Make me laugh, make me cry. Tell me my place in the world. Lift me out of my skin and place me in another. Show me places I have never visited and carry me to the ends of time and space. Give my demons names and help me to confront them. Demonstrate for me possibilities I've never thought of and present me with heroes who will give me courage and hope. Ease my sorrows and increase my joy. Teach me compassion, entertain and enchant and enlighten me. Tell me a story. And that's really at the heart of what we do. Telling you stories that are rooted in fact every day to inform you, to take you places you'd never go, introduce you to people you'd never meet, increase your compassion, motivate you to help somebody else, or in the case of a tragedy, maybe just get you to go home and hug your kids a little bit tighter or ask them how their day was because maybe they're not okay. That's what we do. I appreciate you having me. I'm happy to answer any questions. If everybody else leaves and you have a question for me, I won't be offended.